So the idea for this, this uh, session uh, is to really try and look at some of the critical issues facing collecting perhaps better data uh, for MSF in, in humanitarian crisis settings uh, and overcoming some of the, the clear constraints to collecting data, most obviously security and access to, to information, but also concerns about impinging on operational activities, potential mistrust uh, between researchers, data collectors, uh, and operationally focused uh, staff members, uh, perhaps issues around organizational culture, capacity, and skills, uh, and obviously issues around cost and opportunity costs for collecting data and conducting research. So we have with us uh, a stellar panel uh, it's, why are you shaking your heads? <laughs> so uh, we have uh, Isa. This is where my pronunciation hits a record low. Uh, Isa uh, Siglinecki. Four out of ten, I'll give that one. Uh, we have Vanessa Cramond, Fernando Falero at the end, and uh, Francesco Kecki. So ESA is uh, coordinating operational research for MSF Operational Center Geneva. Vanessa has worked in many roles and countries with MSF and has just returned from Uganda's South Sudanese refugee emergency response. Fernando is importantly an anthropologist um, and she, we, we need more anthropologists, there's plenty of epidemiologists. Uh, so, uh, and she has a role in anthropology, community engagement, and health promotion uh, with MSF Spain. And lastly, but not least, we have Francesco, who is Professor of Epidemiology and International Health at the London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, and uh, epidemiologist extraordinaire. So, <laughs> we're kind of doing this on the fly a bit, but with the intention to try and uh, see how we can understand or get better data in such settings. And firstly, um, I want to, to look into this question of, of how we, this potential attention with balancing data collection needs, and there's lots of arguments why we need more and better data with operational priorities and activities and how we can impact uh, or reduce the impact on operational activities. So uh, perhaps starting with uh, Vanessa, um, how can we achieve that balance between data needs and operational priorities? So I, I guess from a purely sort of field perspective, um, to consider what the purposes of our data capture are and, and primarily to... Microphone. Sorry, um, the purposes of why we collect data, certainly in an emergency context. Uh, it's right there. It's right there. I think Thanks. you have to speak right into yeah, okay. it. So to direct um, our operations is why we collect our data to monitor our, our interventions to make sure that we're doing the right things for the right people at the right time. Um, and to inform our advocacy and I guess alongside that the, the whole raft of, of operational uh, questions that we have to, to improve the humanitarian response and, and the medical response. And I guess that the ultimate crux of, of prioritising those questions and making sure that we collect the right data at the right times without being able to to compromise that day-to-day -day interface and where we want to be, which is in front of, of the patients and of the community. I think one of the challenges we, we face is to not only measure ourselves against um, the people that we see walk through um, you know, the MSF clinic doors, but also to the wider communities that we, we need to serve and, and to make those people who maybe are invisible to us because they haven't seen us before, how do we bring visibility to that? And I think the, the last few um, presentations show that balance between survey, which is looking broader, and, and also against uh, our routine data capture, and that's, that's that perfect interface. Do you want to follow on from that? <clears throat> yeah, sure. I, I think, me, I see it in, in the really same way. I think that the real question is, uh, what is the context and why we are collecting data? Why, why do we need it? And in, in emergencies, I mean, Firstly, we need data to be able to do the work, so we need to understand where we are, but also we need enough data to understand if we are doing is good or bad. So just, but basically, the, even our healthcare and the data from the clinical facilities, if we aren't able to analyze enough to see whether the, our patients are dying or not, it's difficult to, uh, 
to be good in what we are doing. And sometimes in acute emergencies, we actually struggle to collect even the very basic uh, clinical data because our HIS systems are complex and it takes time to put that in place. But then another big part in to be able to run emergency operations is to have enough data to be able to also to document what we are doing and to document the situations of the populations that we are serving, where the surveys come in place, where the primary goes maybe not necessarily directly to direct our interventions, but also to speak out on behalf of the populations. And lastly, in the same context where I think uh, those that work in the emergencies know and people that are immediately demanding data are actually our communication colleagues that need data to be able to say what we are actually doing in this context. Uh, and I think, I hope we'll come back to that. I think outside of that is then the, like what we would call really research mm -hmm. within the emergencies, where I, I, I think especially of the epidemics that need different setup, but where we need to think in advance what questions we want to answer in what context. Sure, I'm just gonna bring Fernando in here and then yeah. Okay. I'm going to bring Francesca so, in after that. Thank you. So let me get the anthropologist a bit <laughs> in the room. Now, just uh, uh, I agree with my, of course, with my, my colleagues are presenting. Like, if we take the question, right, the, what do we know? I would go for like the what, the why, the how, and the when. The when will, I think, take us to different moments and different kind of information that we need and the way to collect it that will be also defined by the when. But then um, the the how we do it and from where we are standing, right, as MSF. That's, that would be my, my starting point of questioning, you know, like a kind of anthropology of the institution. Uh, today, at uh, the uh, opening, uh, Vicky was mentioning that governments should put people at the center. Like I would say, do we do it systematically? Just one example, look at the cloud here. Look at the cloud and see where people are. Like here, small uh, patient, tiny here, uh, refugee here, um, IDP here. But the rest, where are the people? This is diseases, this is issues that MSF needs to tackle from a very medical and scientific way, which I'm not saying is right, wrong. I'm just saying, let's understand who we think we are and how we project ourselves when we are in the field and how we relate to and with the people we are aiming to serve. That also will condition the way we establish a relation with them. We build trust and then we are able to understand the reality. That was also a bit shown in the, in the research that was presented here, you know, like we see what we want to see. We look at inside the clinic, we analyze our data, uh, the, or we, look, we go to the houses, but we look for a specific target population. Also, we label everything, we love that. So we look for that, like Jordanians, I mean, I think we need to widen a bit the analytical scope and understand reality a bit better and give the place to the people to tell us a bit. We need to learn also from locality and maybe there are positive things also happening at local level that can help us to improve you know, what we do and do it in a much better work, way and localized way, using the resources also in a much better way. It's a win-win situation, but it's a change of scope, change of approach, and it's not easy. Okay, thank you, Fernanda. And, um so taking a much more people-centered approach and not, not necessarily just patient-centered approach. Can I just bring in Francesco now, who uh, before this session raised the, the rather fundamental question of, of can MSF actually say its programs are performing well? Yeah, this wasn't at all a plug. I mean, it was yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just to, uh, would, you, would you care to elaborate on that, please, Francesco? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I feel shy after Fernanda. Because, uh, no, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think I think I see a connection there, though. Yeah. Uh, in, in that, um, I mean, I mean, what, I, what what we see a lot of, uh, and it's it's very good in, in in some of the, for example, in some of the scientific days over the years, is uh, is really good data being presented by MSF when they become interested in specific uh, services or vertical programs, uh, be they SGBV surgery, um, then you know HIV at, at, at the most extreme end in terms of quality of monitoring and then and then of course there are these uh, these sort of um, attempts to 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 measure health status in the population or prevalence of malnutrition um, or perhaps even the prevalence of NCD, NCDs. Yeah. But um, I guess my, my worry is that if I, um, and this is a, a little bit presumptuous perhaps, if I asked a general director or a medical director of, of any of the OCs how confident they actually are that some of their general emergency health programs are, are performing uh, and, and that they're actually delivering the stated package of health services, you know, I, 
directors don't shoot, please. Uh, the, 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 I, I'm not so I'm not so sure that 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 information would be necessarily readily available and and interpretable. So um, and, and that for me is a huge matter of, matter of accountability. Um, uh, I know that, uh, for example, health information systems are actually being rolled out by the different OCs in different ways. That's very good. Um, and, and I don't think that it's possible for uh, to overburden programs by by collecting detailed sets of indicators for each for each health service, say antenatal care or routine EPI. Um, so practically, I think what what I'm what I'm seeing as possible is to actually zero in on a few really carefully selected. Uh, indicators that, of course, are flexible given the local package of health services, given the local epidemiological profile. But, but really, what's important, I think, for me is to, is to think of, uh, I'll yield my time later, is, is to think of three types of indicators. Firstly, you need to know about the availability of, of health services. So, most of the, ca all of the population that you're targeting needs to be within the realistic catchment area of your services, be they comprehensive management of, uh, of obstetric emergencies, for example. Secondly, you need to know about the coverage of a service, so whether people are actually utilizing it. Uh, and that's the, in, a, in a way the link with Fernanda, because I think that uh, often if you measure coverage, you realize it's low, and then anthropology really needs to come in because it needs to actually explain why that coverage is low by going to people and stopping, and, you know, no longer seeing people as, as, as objects or patients or medical problems, but rather understanding why they're not accessing care, for example. And lastly, your quality. So those are three quantities that if you multiply them, really enable you to infer uh, performance. Services are available, they have high coverage, and they achieve high clinical quality of care. Uh, a few carefully selected indicators of each should enable you to have a proper picture. Um, they won't explain why certain problems come into being. That's where anthropology, I think, comes in. Thank you. You look like you want to respond. I would just like to react because I think that's very nice and that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I just find it uh, uh, <laughs> rather difficult to, uh, I, I think the, to measure those three uh, indicators, you would need different approaches. We can't measure those through the routinely collected yeah. data yeah. in any case. So we need to, to get this data through the population understanding. Mm -hmm. So I see it rather difficult to do it routinely and to be able to monitor yeah. our uh, interventions this yeah. way. So it's just a challenge. Yeah. Fernanda. Yeah. Just adding on that, I think there, there is a possibility to um, work on developing like a framework that is fit for purpose. That's actually what I'm working on. Like, but based on the reality of humanitarian interventions, not only humanitarian in general, but MSF, MSF way of operating, MSF identity, the principles, all these things, like taking all this into account for the building up of this framework of a feed for purpose tool that can allow you not to be perfect in a sense, let's say scientifically based, uh, research based, but operationally, you know, that will allow you to widen this analytical gaze in a simple manner and you will not need anthropologists in the field, let's say, you know, we have security issues, we operate in remote, we need solutions for that, but we need to be there in the community. In those, that's the reality of how we work. So we need something simple, easy that the whole team can, it, I call it ask the why question. It's very simplistic, I know, but uh, it, it's at, at the end, it's that, it's going a bit beyond what you collect as data and then asking the why, you know, like you were presenting your information, then the reasons why, but that is not a common thing. People ask, you did take the pill? I give an example, did you take your pills? No, next question. And then there's no why, then let's get the why and then let's work out those barriers and let's also ask for the positives. That's something we don't do. We look at everything outside like that, what doesn't work, it's not good. Yeah, all we collect all that, but also, there's some resilience, there's coping mechanisms, people survive without MSF being there. We need to understand how they do it to build up on that, to we can construct together. We can add on something, you know, to the reality of the place, but it has to be done together. That's reality of life, you know, we don't live in a vacuum or in a lab. Sure. So uh, when's your framework going to be ready? <laughs> <laughs> we need your framework. Uh, Vanessa, you had something um, to say. I completely agree with Francesco. I think um, availability, access, coverage, quality, all much, much needed. And I think for all OCs, we've been online with, a, with HIS, which very much looks inside the house, uh, seldom outside 
Um, so I think it is the, the, the valid next questions for us to, to explore. But I do think we need to be realistic around the operational challenges that we face, um, especially in acute emergencies. And I guess that's where any of these contexts, I mean, looking at Jordan, it took us years to get to that point of being able to ask those questions in, in all honesty. So um, being, being clear about, about those ambitions and those timelines, I think those questions can be asked over time when we're settled into a context and we have some understanding. But in acute emergencies, I think we come back to often we know through very, very quickly what needs to be done if it's around water access, around establishing healthcare, around vaccination because there's an, out, an outbreak of measles. For me, the, 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 the key questions around improving what we do and, and our data capture would be around not only looking at the what, but the how, and how do we inform ourselves rapidly um, from the community about the best ways to go about designing a basic healthcare program or how should we go ahead with a mass vaccination in that population? What are the key informations we need from the, that community to make sure that those interventions are, are accepted, are they, that they're fitting um, for within those populations' needs? So I, I guess it's around two stages. One is that acute stage and what we can do and, and the triage that we have to do, the priority setting that we need to have and make those choices and then looking at that longer term view which absolutely needs to include availability and coverage and quality. And can I ask, to what degree is that, it may already exist, but it, it, is there a sort of an overall framework, not necessarily your framework, but within MSF that provides that guidance on the key information requirements? For, for example, it, it could be touching on elements around access, availability, quality. Uh, or is there a need for such a framework or governance framework around data collection priorities and research priorities and activities? Uh, or is that seen as too much of a top-down approach? Should it be more fluid and free and let, let it be very much context-driven and from the bottom up? I don't think such framework exists. <laughs> I don't know if someone... Yeah. The, I, I think, realistic, I think today there is a lot of efforts being put in improving the health information system. So I think over all OCs, there is, uh, I think all OCs are working on that to try to standardize, to be more coherent in the way we collect the data, and also to be able to, even if the systems are not necessarily exactly the same between the sections, to be at least able to com compile the data yeah. when needed. And the, but however, I think even with this, so this is just about collecting data from our patients. You know? So it's not, uh, it's patient based, uh, either uh, compiling data or individual data. But the, I think even with those systems, what remains difficult is the complexity of the data collection systems. And when it comes to emergencies, we have really difficulties to, even if we have standardized system in place, to implement it timely in the field. So that's and this is just the part about the patient care and yeah. I think the around the how we don't have I'm not sure necessarily we need to have standardized approaches on uh, I think we have to look at the context what additional information we need from the population to be able to answer these other questions around the advocacy and the uh, témoignage uh, and how to adapt programs based on the population <clears throat> data. But I think that then the, these uh, key issues of the access, accessibility, uh, coverage, I think that has to, to come. In the, but I, and I think it will very much depend on the each context. And I think where, where I really think what we have to, if we want to get good data, we need to be we need to prioritize. We need to know what in this context we need and for what purpose to be able to get most out of it. Sure. Francesco? Yeah, I, I, I didn't want to give the impression that I, you know that I think we should um, be overly complex. I mean, I think if, if you're if you're in the acute emergency phase, then really I, I'm just thinking, you know, consultation rate, right? So firstly, firstly, take some time to establish the population denominator. That that can be very very important because unless you know how many people are in the catchment population, it's really difficult to to say anything about performance. So that may take maybe a few days sometimes, in, but but it, but it really it really brings a lot of <laughs> it really really brings a lot of booms. Um, but then you know a simple in, a simple metric of utilization is the consultation rate. If you've got a, a, the population estimate, then then every MSF program can tell you how many consultations they've done in the last week. They should. <laughs> so so really, I didn't mean for to suggest you know hundreds of indicators from the very start, but a few carefully selected ones I think is probably feasible. There is some some technical difficulty with, for example, implementing a DHIS2, which I know MSF is, and, and others are, are looking to use for HMIS 
in the acute phase because it's a little bit clunky. So, but that's that's more in the area of I think of of software platforms and simplifying that, and it's possibly something that can be can be tackled with technology, <laughs> not, still, not completely. But we're still in a stage where probably <clears throat> most emergency settings, we can't, uh, we don't disag disag disaggregate at all by, by age or, or gender. So we're, we're still at an informative stage. And I think this is the right moment, I think, yeah. for, for the movement to harness those yeah. next big questions. Absolutely. Looking at Uganda, for example, just uh, over 50, over 60 mortality rates. What is the right thresholds? What should we define in emergency? What are the actions around that that we should be taking? And I think these are these are key questions for us now. Um, we've we've got buy on the under five. We've got five, buy on the crude. And now now what's next? And I think we're going to have to invest somehow in house to to start to look at that. To start to look at those bigger groups. We're working with an aging population almost everywhere we work. So I think we've, we've got some, some big work and big challenges ahead well, so in that area. I expect what Barry was, was asking is a valid question. You know, it, 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 maybe you do need some sort of framework because not every field team is born equal. You know, some are very inexperienced, yeah. some are yeah. less. Yeah. And turnover, yeah, but, turnover yeah. of teams, yeah, which that's is the point ultimate I was, challenge. I was going to bring now the human, again, anthropologists. Like when, I, when, I, when we are saying like people center, it's also understanding who is working in the projects, who is in the field, and what kind of stress they're undergoing, what are the capacities, their skills, their approach to the work that we are intending to do because in my change and also the rotation of staff one person there's an article very interesting that talks about uh, humanitarian aid not being evidence-based because it's eminence based it depends who comes it's like I have my experience you know we do this like this like that and then the next person six months later changes everything and it's like okay so that has an impact, of course, in you know how we do. And one person may have an approach, the other one another. So we work also with tools, with standardized procedures, with with um, frameworks. So let's define one, but in a way that is kind of flexible enough and uh, useful enough to be contextualized. It's like an oxymoron. Let's contextualize systematize no let's systematize contextualization an oxymoron but that's that would be the key you know how do we make it systematic but also ensuring that we contextualize and we look for the things that we need to look for in order to be able to operate be in that program whatever that be and be that co context whatever that context is not easy but think about the human think about reality that's for me the key thing you know not in a lab or in a vacuum or a special situation, you know, it's like reality. Let's get not the picture, the video, where they're coming from, what's going on, how the situation affected the life of people, what is good that is left that we can work with, and then what needs to be, you know, uh, supplied and, you know, what kind of support we can provide within oh. the reality. Okay, thank you, Fernanda. Yeah. So um, I'm sure some of you may have some points or questions, uh, so I'm going to open it up. Um, Stefano, I think you you had a point that you wanted to make. If we could just bring the mic down here. Uh, and uh, also one point up there. And if you could keep them brief, because we only have a few minutes left, please. Thank you. That is for Francisco. Uh, actually, I disagree a little bit. But I mean, I think that in, during this panel discussion, uh, something was a little bit neglected. And that is, I mean, we, we do need data on uh, the quantity of activities. And as you said, it's very important to have the target population and then the number of consultation. But within MSF, we tend to forget that we are a medical organization. And also, the quality of what we do is very important because we can do very many consultations and often uh, most of the people is happy with that. But then if you prescribe the wrong drug or you actually you do the wrong diagnosis and I still think that there is a, a little bit uh, more to do on this side because there is just you know to put it simple the operational attitude is still prevailing with MSF and there is not always the right concern about the quality of the medical uh, you know of the medical performances that we give <coughs> thank you um, so we have one question up there and then also a question from the online audience Hi, uh, Sid Wong, MSF. My question is around how data informs operational choices. So let me give you an example. Um, an urban setting of acute conflict. Within that setting, um, there are patients that are visible. Um, for example, the war wounded. But there are also patients that are invisible. Victims because the healthcare structures around the violence is just completely uh, crippling around us. To what extent and how much more should we be doing um, to actually capture, quantify, and, and, and make visible 
those victims that aren't necessarily uh, apparent to us. Thank you for that. I mean, I think some of the points you yeah. certainly both of you have raised at the end, yeah. yeah. I, I think we need to get out of the facilities for sure. And there are ways, but maybe we don't have these ways localized. I mean, no, like we need to understand locality and understand what are the existing networks. People still live in that reality that for us, from our perspective, it's impossible. We cannot move, we cannot go out, but they somehow live and they survive in that reality. Let's listen to them, but active listening and understanding the networks, understanding what works for them. And then we can you know, see where MSF can you know, chip in, not only getting the information, but getting the connections, the community engagement, like the key people. That Not key people are always related to leaders or religious uh, you know, key persons, but it can be you know, uh, thinking from our intervention that is very specific, like we are a medical organization. We work here with, let's say, malaria. OK, let's look at key people for malaria in this community. Let's try to get there and ask the right questions to the right people. Sometimes we undermine our national staff, like the cleaners, the drivers. They are people from the community. They know a lot of things. Let's have dialogue with them and not treat them as Inferior. Sorry, I'm, I'm not being, but sometimes it happens. There's a division, okay. us and them. You know, but I'm just Sorry. to bring in the other other panel members. <laughs> Is I would just like to comment on that because I'm not sure. Like, in this context, I think the what. Uh, um, from the, the story from Yemen that was just presented or what we are doing in Iraq today. I, I think you are in the war context. We know that there is no access to other health care. So as soon as if, if, there, if we provide possibilities for taking care of other patients, these patients would come. So I, I think just like in the case from Yemen or other examples, I think by us providing these services, we will know that people need them. I, I'm not sure we need, I, I think, understanding the context and knowing that there's no uh, other health facilities available should be enough for us to offer the services and then we will see from the patients we, c we have as well uh, what the actual needs are and then we can go more in deep but I think just knowing the context and where we are and knowing that obviously it's not just the war wounded in any population there is women delivering and uh, acutely ill people whatever the context is the, sorry so final question I'm afraid uh, so and that comes from our online audience, Jay. So I think it's a question directed probably to Vanessa and Isa. Um, and it relates a little bit, it links in with Innovation Day tomorrow um, and relates to the fact, do, do we do we prioritize getting results and data on treatment results and neglect some of the process, process data that maybe we could collect to innovate what we routinely do? <laughs> I think we do prioritise results and outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. Have we, I, I'm trying to think now of some indicators that, that outline process, and I'm struggling outside of maybe HIV care and TB care. I think that might be a little bit on vaccination, I guess. So, yeah, no, we, we have some major gaps on our performance of our care. Um, and I think with that will come a triage of what are the key indicators that we need to capture on that for outside of, of our chronic diseases, I guess. <laughs> I'm not sure if I really understand what the, I, I'm sure we, and I think actually, I think we should prioritize the patient outcomes because I think that's our key purpose. And I think the understanding how our system, I mean, that comes a bit to the, I think the point of Francesco. I think we need to understand how we work and how to optimize the, the uh, our performances. But I think as MSF, I think our, uh, I think if we have to prioritize, we will always prioritize towards the patients. But then I think we should think how uh, in our routine uh, reporting, we, we capture the, the key other elements. But I guess the process, you know, the way you do it impacts the outcome. So you have to understand the process to be able to change it soon enough to have a better outcome, I think. Okay, so I'm going to uh, wrap up there. It, uh, We've been advised that it is an opportune moment to take many of these issues forward. Clearly, MSF is uh, in the lead of being able to take this forward. It has the position, the advantage of being able to, to do that. And so, in a sense, there is a responsibility on MSF to keep leading the way in this work uh, and to be able to address this oxymoron of systematic contextualization. Uh, we'll follow up on that next year and your framework.